Hello, everyone. We'll be getting started just in two minutes. We're going to give everyone two minutes to get comfortable and get online, and then we'll begin. If you're just joining us now, welcome. We'll be getting started at two minutes past the hour, so we get a chance to everyone to, um, to get comfortable and get online. Hi, Angel. Welcome. Emily, good to see you. <laughs> All right, Proton Power Gaming, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Steve, really good to see that you joined us today. All right, we have Nikolai and Shiva from Nepal. Kevin, thank you for joining us as well. Angel. So we got people from Canada and Mexico and Nepal, Switzerland, the United States already signing on. Okay, Nikos, very good to see you. Alan, good to see you from the East Coast. Hector, US Virgin Islands, all right. Artash from Canada, Donald checking in from Sweden. Very international audience. We have Heinz Bernd from, from Germany. Fairbanks, Alaska represented. Okay, go UAF. And we now have Pennsylvania. This is starting, this audience is definitely representative of, uh, of our community, very international. Hillman from Indonesia, good to have you. All right, Alan from Denmark. I see people are, are still joining. So we're gonna give it maybe one more minute and then we'll get started officially. Okay, we now have Australia represented, California, the Philippines. So we have a strong representation so far from uh, Southeast Asia as well. New Zealand, excellent, good to have you. All right, Christy, wow, thank you for joining us from Texas. All right, I get really excited when I see names that I recognize. I see a lot of names that I recognize. All right, we have France, Massachusetts. Marcelo from Syracuse, very close to where I was born and raised. Tom Mack, okay, New Hampshire. All right, so I think we can begin. Happy Citizen Science Month to everyone and welcome to the first Mover and Shaker event. Um, this is hopefully the first of many events that we'll be running for you. So my name is Brandon Christensen. I'm the CEO at Raspberry Shake and I'll be your host today. Uh, as CEO, I have the great pleasure of interacting with and, and having gotten to know and offered technical support for so many of you out there in the audience. And I also have the distinct pleasure of serving an incredibly talented and growing number of professionals who in some way fulfill their sole purpose in life by creating the professional and personal seismographs that so many of you out there in the audience enjoy. Now, before I begin, I would like to take a moment to thank all the people at Raspberry Shake who have worked so hard over the past week and who are working now in the background to ensure that this is a successful event. These are as many people, our team is about 20 people strong. Um, more than half of them are involved in today's event and they're working behind the curtain and out of the spotlight just to make sure everything goes smoothly. So thank you, Raspberry Shake. Now today, um, we know that there's gonna be around 300 people in our audience. And we're very excited that about half of those people are people we know and people we've interacted with before, they're the shakers. They're people who already have a raspberry shake at home and they share our enthusiasm for seismology. Now there's also about half the audience today from what we can tell don't have raspberry shake and they're just supposedly interested in what we're doing. And we hope that today's event is an inspiration for you to join our community. So welcome to you and welcome to everyone. 
Now, in an effort to get to know our audience a little better, you will see a poll appear now within Zoom, within the Zoom interface. And we would like you to please take a moment to look over this poll, to answer the two questions. And this will help us understand our audience today and better help us create content for you in the future. Uh, this will just take a quick second. You could do it in the background while I go through the introduction and my team expresses their gratitude in advance for you taking the time to answer these two questions. Now let's talk a little bit about Raspberry Shake. Raspberry Shake was founded uh, four or five years ago now. Can't believe so much time has gone by, but it was founded to spread the enthusiasm we have for doing seismology to hobbyists around the world. And we wanted to do so in the hopes that geophysical institutes who are doing seismology on a professional level would be able to leverage the power that we could harness from the citizen science community to densify their seismic networks. And in doing so, to serve as a catalyst for them to make a transition from the, trans from the traditional sparse seismic networks to the modern, highly dense seismic networks like the one we've been able to create with Raspberry Shake. Naturally, our first event today is designed to help us uh, celebrate the bridge that's already been created between the citizen science community and the professional seismology community. So our speakers, Thomas Lecoq and Mark Vanstone represent both of those communities. And over Twitter and through other medium at towards the end of last year, a number of scientists came together to study the impact of the pandemic on the level of seismic noise worldwide. And this event allowed them to exploit the data, not only from the Raspberry Shake community, but the broader scientific community, but the data from the Raspberry Shake community, the data that the Raspberry Shakers share in real time that is archived historically was a big part of this study. And so they'll be talking to you about that publication. It's a significant publication and that it came out in science's number one uh, peer reviewed journal, which is called Science. So before I pass on and introduce our first speaker, I'd like to take a minute to talk about the format of today's event. Today's event will allow us to share this space for two hours. In the first 30 minutes, Thomas, our professional seismologist, will talk to us about his findings. We're then gonna open up the floor for the first of three Q&A sessions. This one will last 15 minutes. Now, inside of the Zoom interface, you will be able to see a Q&A feature. We encourage you that throughout the presentations today that you take time to interact with us and to ask questions. Our team will be working in the background to aggregate your questions and to, um, to curate them so that when it comes to the Q&A session, I can ask our speakers questions that represent your interest best. Then I will introduce everyone to our second speaker, Mark Vanstone, that represents the citizen science community. And Mark will speak for 20 minutes, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Now, in order to ensure that we have time to deal with and answer everyone's questions, or at least as many questions as we can, we're gonna have an additional 30 minutes of questions at the end after both talks. And then I'll close up with some final comments and we'll close out this two hours that we have together. I encourage you to stay for the entire time because at the end, Raspberry Shake is gonna make an exclusive offer that we hope will be a catalyst to help grow this community beyond the around 2000 actively participating members that we have today to a much broader uh, community. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, 
Thomas, you can go ahead and turn on your microphone so you're ready to jump in when I finish the introduction. Thomas is, um, represents the professional community. He is a self-proclaimed long-term geek, like so many of us inside Raspberry Shake and the Raspberry Shake community. Uh, he studied geology, and he wants me to share with you that the reason he studied geology is because it was the science that ensured that he'd be able to spend the most time outside of the classroom and outdoors. Now, finishing up his degree in seismology, he went on to do a PhD program, um, sorry, geology. He went on to do a PhD program with the Royal Observatory in Belgium. And since 2011, Thomas has enjoyed being a full-time staff member at the Royal Observatory. Thomas um, is known on social media as at SeismoTom. He is an incredibly approachable and personable scientist. He is a self-proclaimed Python addict, and he's also a self-proclaimed science catalyst. Now, I think that anyone who's interacted with Thomas, as Mark will be able to test, um, testify to when he gives his talk, will um, agree that Thomas has an outsized ability to bring people together and get them behind doing new and unique science. So without further delay, Thomas, I pass the floor to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for this introduction and, and uh, thank you for having me today. It's, uh, it's an honor to be there. Um, and you'll see later during my presentation that I'm no longer ashamed. I also own a Raspberry Shake now, so I can really do this. Um, so, so thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk uh, a bit about uh, the elements of what we've done together uh, with the community as seismologists um, in, the, in the past year and in a few days. Um, and I took the liberty to have some words about what we did, some words about the work of the others, of others, and also how to uh, bridge. And this is why this first slide is a nice bridge um, between the community, your community, um, the the hackers, the say, citizen seismologists, the citizen scientists, um, and and the um, and the research world. So um, you see that um, I'm, I'm going to go through slides, sometimes very fast, sometimes I'll take more time. Um, all in all, Brandon, don't be afraid. I will respect the 30 minute uh, time. So um, first, a small recap. Um, well, maybe uh, th this was already um, mentioned in the past that 2020 in the end was the, the year that uh, Hollywood was right. Uh, we were actually waiting for that year to happen, and it was not a big tsunami and st storms and flying helicopters, but that was a tiny little bug, a virus that just kicked us all in the face. So um, we all know this timeline, COVID-19 timeline, started back in December, well, December last year now, um, and the first case were reported end of January, first casualty February, and for example, in Belgium, we knew there were a few cases in February, but it was taken seriously after 11th of March, when most countries in Europe um, and in the Western, uh, Western Europe were experiencing a lot of cases, and specifically in Italy, for example. And then, of course, um, the report of cases were really strong in mid-March. And that led to this statement by the Director General of the WHO, who said that we have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. And okay, I choose the font of this of this slide to, to match what movies Hollywood would, would, would make. And if Hollywood would, would have said that, no one would have believed it, but it was the case. And in the recommendations of the WHO, he said that uh, countries need to uh, impose, create rules to prevent this virus to spread. And those um, elements, we all know them as lockdowns. So lockdown measures were enforced all over the world. Um, well, in actually most of all the places in the world and different hashtags, different places, different things happened, appeared like stay home, save lives. Even Google made a GIF out of it. Um, and yeah, poetically, this first time we see the streets so empty, so quiet cities, people discover that birds exist in their cities but also the world discovers who the ex essential workers are. And it might not have been the people you have thought a year ago, but indeed, there's a lot of people who are essential that are for our communities. 
So we discovered the word lockdown. And what happens when, when humans stop? I mean, when we do stop things or we do things, um, well, this butterfly effect that we know is that whatever we do, that we have an impact on the environment at all spatial scales and temporal scales, from local to global effects, from instant to centuries of evolution of climate, for example. And so, to put, simply put, when human act, the environment reacts. So seismologists, and this is my, my work, I'm a seismologist, and I do like noise, and you'll see later in the, in the slides that actually there's a reason why. Um, but we know, and you know, for those of you who own a Raspberry Shake, that noise alters seismogram readings. You probably have been very, very angry at your seism uh, um, Raspberry Shake app, looking at an event of magnitude six in Japan and seeing that this was the same time as the washing machine was doing the final cycle. So noise is annoying for seismologists since the very early days. We were trying, seismologists were trying to put the sensors outside of cities, far away from the noise generated by industry. But then in, in a sense, it was difficult too, because at those days, during those days, like a century ago, well, rural stations were difficult to maintain because you need to go there every 12 hours to change paper records. So you still need to be quite close to humans. And noise is everywhere. We record noise and you, you've seen it uh, in, in, your, in your records. Um, and noise, or what we also call now continuous ground vibration recorded by a seismometer, which is a little less uh, annoying for people who, who do physics, because noise is a term that people don't like, because it's something like electronic noise or vibrations that you cannot, uh, that are not real, that are not physical. Um, but they are part of, of what we record every day, and, and the ocean is a big, big player in that game, but humans are also culprit, and I'm going to show you some examples of, of that later, of course. And then since probably um, the very beginning, the seismic noise or seismic wave field was used, a micro seism was studied in, back in, in early 1900s. And then it became a la mode, we say in French, in the early 2000s, when uh, scientists uh, in, in France, in the US, and then elsewhere, uh, discovered that you can actually extract coherent information from this wave field. So using seismometers, whatever their quality, as soon as they're quite enough, then you can use them to look at waves that travel from one to the next, and then you extract information from those safety records. So how do we know we are actually culprit as humans for this high frequency noise? And I specifically talk about high frequencies here. Well, if you look at the record in blue here of the seismic noise levels in uh, Brussels, and you see that I marked the weekends, the Christmas holidays, and even the New Year Eve uh, night, and you see that, uh, well, it seems that my fellow Belgians are party animals and that for New Year Eve, it's the noisiest night of all year, but also during the holidays, they're quite quiet. If you look at this, this data here, split over 24 hour clock, like a watch for the 24 hour clock, you see that all the colors here are each day and the brown and the blue are weekends. And if you see these bump here, do these two bumps between one and three, three and a half, four in the morning. This is early Saturday and early Sunday, also called Friday night and Saturday night. So it's more noisy in the city, recorded by the seismometer in Brussels, which is not, I mean, at the time it was installed in the suburbs where the city expanded. And so this city is still quite, quite noisy. Um, and so we, we record that, we record all these elements and there's nothing that has this periodicity of day and night and weekends and weekdays and Sundays and Saturdays and New Year Eve other than humans. I mean, we can we can blame the wind for part of the noise. We can blame uh, maybe to modulate this noise, but then the cycles are obviously human. Well, we could also do fun stuff and I encourage you to, to look at your data from, from Raspberry Shakes. Um, well, on the right, you see a uh, spectrogram. So it is a frequency content versus time um, that is that is uh, three and a half hour, I think two hours, uh, yeah, two hours um, of time here in vertical east, west, and north, south components. And the bands you see here are resonance induced by people jumping during a Prodigy concert that we recorded in 2009. And this has been shown here, but also done shown by 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 Diaz for um, Diaz Diaz for um, in Barcelona. And, and this is known to us for a long time, of course. We know that when people start jumping and beat on the beat of the music, they are very nice, nice resonators and making the structures resonate. On the left, you have a burglarogram. 
this is something that uh, Klaus Hims and colleagues in in, uh, in Cologne have evidence that uh, they were they were robbed and they used the seismometer to tell the police the exact timing of the movements of the guys in the house because they could track them using seismometers. And there's also freaky, scary parts. This is a paper that was published for the Technologies for Homeland Security. And these guys were using seismometers to try to separate people walking, walking stealthily, or even dogs on, on the, on the uh, front of a house and using a seismometer. So we record a lot of things. So when we paced down in Brussels, for example, we, would, we knew that the noise would go down. We knew that it would be uh, very um, str strong because it was also quieter. I mean, you can hear it was quieter. Um, and we were teleworking. And for some, including me, it was the first time I was teleworking like uh, all days, every day. Um, and so I tweeted first with the official seismology account from the observatory and then with my own account, with a different, you see, different way of presenting the information that, okay, that was the third day or the second day of, of strict lockdown. Um, and I wanted to show that first, okay, our team works, but also that um, we all do the same. So we, we might feel alone home being really like uh, isolated, but in the end, all people in Brussels were doing the same. And so we had the same uh, effect common effect, we just participate to this common effect of lowering the seismic noise, then you see that when I shared this information, I also added some things that are close to my heart, my, my plot leave of spy and project Jupiter, because these codes are running on those platforms and using these, the, 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 the time put by all the volunteers and, and the community behind these projects, of course. So this information went uh, viral, it's a bad joke, uh, when relayed by Gizmodo. I was very, very proud to be relayed on by on Gizmodo. I mean, this is this is really a strong. I mean, as as a born geek, you you want to be featured on Gizmodo once, and I was done. So I was very proud. But the good thing with that was also that Ryan Mandelbaum did a very nice paper and also sh already showed elements uh, coming from different places, people sharing information on Twitter, um, and because we were already discussing the thing on Twitter, and a lot of people were already putting out. Um, data and, and, and plots, uh, we could link these different requests for interviews to the right piece person. Nothing is best for a, an interviewer than to have a local person that can talk about the local station. So we had that, that effect. We had that in Germany, in Spain, in, in even in, um, in uh, South America, in, in Brazil, we had people answer the press that were local to the seismic station, could really identify the elements to talk to the press. So we were locked down. But we are actually free because thanks to the modern world and the internet, we are really connected. And so open sourcing the code to generate these graphs of seismic noise, like the one I showed you for Brussels, um, immediately triggered interest for many people, including our next speaker, Mark, Mark Van Stone. Um, and every time there was a new, new type of graph, new type of plot coming in. Mark would just apply it, try it, debug it <laughs> often, and also help us make a um, the version with Frédéric Massin to run on the Raspberry Shake uh, FDSN set up by the guys who host this, this meeting today, who opened the archive for all everyone so we can really get this information from any sensors and Mark, including his, from uh, the backfill his archives from, from, from Panama. So open sourcing the code, very simple code in the end, but then providing a way, thanks to also to Tobias Megies and, and others who have helped that this GitHub code was runnable online on Binder, we could really tell people, okay, you just have, it's just a click button code, just input your station name and you get a result. And that really triggered a lot of interest. And it was really, really nice to see how the community as a whole reacted to this. Then I tweeted a very crazy tweet on the 1st of April asking like, what if we just would join us our forces all together, uh, tagging a few people and then tagging uh, half a half a thousand be, be below it and then emailing this also to people asking, okay, what about writing this paper like social seismology or whatever we call it and writing this week? Uh, well, it, it, it turned out it took 10 weeks to write, but in the end it's what's quite fast. So yeah, we were isolated. But I was, I really feel, and we discussed it a lot with other people, connected like never before. On this Slack group we had, we are 113 people over all time zones. And we see that after uh, the paper was published, I think this is December, we had already 13,000 messages exchanged between seismologists, but also 
non-seismologists, let's say professional seismologists, but who are actually real seismologists, and I'm going to come back to that later. So in the end, we processed 337 seismic stations, some had gaps, some had um, errors, some are so in the end, more, more than 200 were, were valid. And in, the, in those, we had 60 raspberry shakes. So indeed, as, as announced by, uh, by Brandon in, in, the, in the blog post, uh, we heavily relied on raspberry shakes for this study. And the reason why we did that is very simple. Raspberry shakes are installed at people's place. And usually, people's place are not the furthest remote place in the world. They are closer to human activity. And, of, and, and we were expecting those raspberry shakes, of course, to have lower, a bit stronger effect of lockdown measures or lockdown reduction of seismic noise, just because they are closer to people. While seismometers far in rural areas, like for example, uh, Emily could talk uh, about it, I think, about the USGS station that are further away, well installed, isolated. Um, these stations show of if, if at all any effect of the lockdowns. And so we analyze all these stations. What you see here in red are stations for which we have an obvious effect of the lockdown on the seismic noise levels. It means a reduction of those levels. And in blue is the, uh, the fact that the lockdown was not observed. Or either there were no lockdown imposed, or it was just the activity as usual, or a difficult to extract or to really um, uh, decipher a contribution from lockdown to, to something else. The size of this scatter plot is uh, inversely proportional to the population data. And for this, we acknowledge the NASA for sharing grid files of population density estimates for the whole world, which are quite actu accurate, actually. So this is the most crazy figure I think I will ever make. This figure is composed of the seismic energy, if you want, or amplitude at each station. This is a line. Each line is one station, one city, one seismometer. And they have all been normalized so that the normal Saturday, uh, Sunday night to um, Tuesday afternoon, if you want, would be zero to 100%. And so you would have like the normal scale is a normal day of energy, minimum, maximum. They are all normalized. And then you see that we have the Christmas holidays here that break the weekly cycles where we have this blue band here. And this blue band is really all the weekends. And then here, a little white dot is the start of lockdown measures being enforced in the country. And you see that immediately after, on all these cases, you have a blue, dark blue color appearing. The seismic noise dropped not dramatically everywhere. For example, here in Norway was a little less dramatic than uh, if you look at here in Nepal, uh, where the seismometers, as we actually raspberry shakes, I'm going to show you a picture later, are installed in schools. But then, so most of the stations we studied experienced a drop of noise that is much, that is in, in the 50% uh, range, and often lower than Christmas even. So it was really, really quiet. And if we look at the median, so the kind of uh, the, 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 the most probable uh, value of all these uh, stations, we see that all in all in the world, we have daily cycles. We have Christmas and New Year. Most of the countries do have it. Some places don't because, for example, a ski resort is not quiet at Christmas or New Year. Our uh, non-Christian countries have a little less noise because also linked to tourism and stuff like that. But it's of course li linked to the to the place where the station stations are installed. And this this year, the colored uh, values are the ones coming from the um, uh, mobility data provided by Big Brother, so Apple, Apple, and Google, and others. And you show you see that this orange line is the amount of people staying home more. That's the residential category, and all the others are like commuting, workplaces, and stuff. And so the seismic noise correlates with people staying home, well, anti-correlates, so it drops when people stay home more. So in the end, yeah, it led to a 76 water paper uh, with age span. I didn't ask people because you don't do that, but I think we are from 20-ish to 70-ish years old, uh, from undergrad to uh, emeritus. 
um, all these people joined together, processed data, discussed the content of what the paper should be, participated to review. Um, interactive review on, on Google Doc was was interesting. I mean, I could I, I wish we had a film of that because you see people filling in the interactive review. Every line of the paper was reviewed by at least five people. This is this is mental. As I said, sixty raspberry shakes were used, and we are very happy with the line put uh, by um, Marine and um, and Tarier that uh, it, it defines somehow what we wanted to do. Uh, is the uh, the crowdsourcing of citizen science projects. It's benefiting from it in most cases, but some of the co-authors also were analyzing their own. And this is something that also is close to our hearts, is that it's we don't, didn't steal from all these people. We really also use things that people were put together, uh, putting together. So what else? Yeah, there's a lot of studies going on on Brazil, China, dark fibers. I, I can talk for hours about that. But maybe you want to hear more. Uh, what about the raspberry shakes? Um, so, well, we had examples, for example, from uh, Ben van der Plum from uh, Michigan. And, and this was a famous uh, uh, blog post, I think, also on, the, on your website, uh, showing this, this raspberry shake next to the stadium and this huge drop of seismic noise during uh, the, the lockdown and the stay at home orders that were imposed there. And you see also here Christmas and New Year are in the same scale, but you still have more energy than when you have here the lockdown and no one moves. You have all my, my two favorite spammers, uh, Alan and Jay, uh, tweeting and, and, and Facebooking uh, an immense amount of, of information. Uh, Alan updating his graph of is, is the Anthropos, uh, is the name, um, over, comparing seismic noise, moving moving windows. Uh, well, he does that on MATLAB. That's why the graphs are really ugly. But anyway, um, and then Jay um, trying to see. So you see the green line here. The graph is, is really bad. Sorry. That is the normal uh, noise level before lockdowns. And you see that it reached back. It's, it's normal, uh, some close to, to, to March this year. But actually, it's because they were just doing construction work on the highway. So. What we record with seismic noise might sound creepy when I talk to you about the people walking walking in front of house, but actually it's also very, very hackable. If you just have a washing machine next to it, then your seismic noise is high and then no one can survey or monitor you. So raspberry shakes and seismic windows in general can be really good seismic noise tools for education. We have here Jordi Diaz in Barcelona with his network installed in Barcelona, showing events, filtering events, or showing the lockdown effect. This is the project from, from uh, Shiba Subedi in Nepal with Raspberry Shakes, which is a brilliant, crazy project to equip, not only put seismometers in school, but also empower people by training them, showing them why it's important. And, and this whole generation that's going to go out of school knowing what an earthquake is and what a seismometer is. And I think this is, this is a brilliant, brilliant project. And this is also, I mean, thanks to the availability of low cost citizen science grade but quality, high quality uh, type, I like the raspberry shakes. Um, in, in general, we also have, I think, Artash, I saw, I saw your name, you're here, and I'm going again to, to show your, your, your stuff. So this is Artash, he's, I don't know what age you are now, like ninth grader uh, from Canada. He, he built this robot, duct taped, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure your parents must be very proud of the duct tape they bought, uh, glued to your, um, taped to your window, outside window in Toronto. Uh, and monitoring your city and your street with a camera, car detector, tram detector, seismometer, everything, just to know and to try to understand what you're looking at. And I think this is just is an example of this is doable. This is accessible for people and for children. And then this this project from Megan and Louis in in Australia, um, converting this this uh, notebook we we shared, the code we shared, to an automatic automatically generated daily plots that they use in seismometers at school projects in Australia, which is seismometers at school, a project that are run in many countries, including France. And this is really successful projects to, uh, to really um, give, give kids um, tools to understand math, physics, geography, geology, anything. Uh, we also, as professionals, as Brandon say, use them. And I put a bunch of screenshots showing you that these little tools are really used everywhere. This is a paper uh, looking at glaciers. Oliver Lamb tried to listen to elephants. Uh, Shu et al, they look at the, this river uh, here and then um, storm surge in the river. 
a flood surge. And then Rafael Duplan he used it for um, the heavy um, respiratory shake network in, in Mexico and used to study the lockdown effect in different parts of the city, depending on what type of neighborhood, what, what if it's a, it's a residential, if it's a, it's a busy or business neighborhood. This is uh, using raspberry shakes because these raspberry shakes are known now. Uh, probably five years ago, Brandon was on the, uh, of the, one of the few convinced, but today it's known that they are high quality, high frequency certainly, and down to probably a few seconds of period, very good instruments. This is recorded, Brandon, I'm sure. Um, we also do it. We also finally use it. Uh, and I bought one for myself and one for uh, my mentor who retired this year. And this is the one I bought for myself. So if you look at this, the code of that one, it looks like it's in, in my place, but sometimes it's, it's been moved. This was attached to a um, stalagmite in the framework of a PhD project we have at the Royal Observatory of Belgium that is trying to link 3D scans, mod, uh, finite element modeling, and in situ monitoring of vibrations of stalagmites. And the idea is that if a stalagmite is still standing, it means it wasn't broken by an earthquake. If it wasn't broken by an earthquake, if we can estimate what is required to break it, then we know that this event did not occur. So we can really kill some parts of the seismic hazard, or at least we try. So yeah, what my point, and then last last part of this presentation, very short, don't, don't, be, don't be afraid, Brandon, um, is going to be very philosophical. And I, I think uh, I want, I want, I will address some of the slides will be, I mean, if you take it personally, then that was the point, right? Everyone. So amateurs or professionals, we are one community. We are, um, so I, I, I don't have your videos guys, but I would like people just in front of their computer camera off, raise your hand because you are seismologist. <laughs> Amazing. I see, I see people raising hands. It, it's, it's saying on my screen too. Yes, I'm happy for that. Well, I'm actually happy, very happy for that guy. He looks really, really into it. Um, so we are scientists, citizens, hackers, and children are scientists. But sometimes scientists like professionals tend to forget that they are citizens and hackers, and they were children too. So. There are many ways for us professionals to engage with the community and there are many ways for the community to engage with professionals and i think this slide is is, is a very fantastic summary of what i want to share is that as long as you're motivated by a passion something that really drives you and, and for example the study we did all together was i never had any issue waking up in the morning i was waking up an hour before the alarm clock during the period of, of doing this analysis all together with people in the world and going to bed at one o'clock in the evening no problem passion is essential so rule number one dear colleagues and others be open share knowledge codes data results failures times ids and donuts sometimes these are by the way the best donuts in process uh, if one day we can join together, I'm, I'm sure you, you will enjoy them. We need to share. We need to share. There is no reason, no patent, nothing that would prevent us to share codes, data, results, failures. Important to share failures, time and ideas together. And there, they're overpassing old school codes. You don't do that because no one did it before. Yeah, sure, just do it. Oh, no, don't share your code. Someone's going to steal it and make commercial out of it. Yeah, sure, do it. Don't wait, just share. Because in the end, what's important, and that's something that is my daily motivation, is that in the end, science has to move forward. The rest is futile. So I will end up with this slide. The first top line is the the first uh, acknowledgement we put in the paper that we dedicate this community study and actually all the all the talks i've done since then are dedicated to all the essential workers who have kept our countries going during difficult times um the two lines here the white one and the and the, and the raspberry colored one are the ones we put also there because we couldn't have done this paper without the energy of the operators and the courage and of course the resources of all these uh, network operators but we couldn't have done it either be without the passionate community you guys running their home seismometers and contributing to a better understanding of the earth so with this i thank you for your attention i also draw your attention to the right bottom part of this of this slide we are getting ready to start our own 
open diamond open access journal free for all meaning everyone will be allowed to submit for free and publish for free and read for free seismic content and essential workers kept our countries going non-essential workers like the guys here plot on the on the figure on the on the photo uh kept the motivation of some others like me running like we also should think about the ones that are less happy and less lucky than us and have been really struggling in, in this period of time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thomas, thank you so much for that. Can you hear me well, Thomas? Yeah, yeah I can do it. I do, I do. Should I? I, All will right. stop. I? I will stop sharing for that so you can see it. Great. Excellent presentation. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you for taking the time to put it together. And I wasn't expecting you to showcase so many different ways that people within the professional and citizen science community were using Raspberry Shake. So I appreciate that as well. We've got a, a number of questions from people in the audience. It looks like the audience is around 170 people strong. Uh, there's been quite a few questions that have come in in the comments section and the Q&A. And so we'll do our best to just address as many of them as we can. Um, so Thomas, are you ready for the first question? Go for it. All right. So this is, this is an easy one. The, uh, someone in the community would like to know what program you used to construct the map figure where you plot the effect of the lockdown. The, uh, the, the big figure or the yeah, map? The map. Yeah. Maybe, maybe um, talk in general about some of the, yeah. so, so uh, everything is, that. yeah, everything is Python based. Um, okay. Seismic waveforms are read with OpsPy. Plotting is done with Matplotlib and Cartopy. Uh, Cartopy is a project by the Met Office in the UK. Um, and this 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 fantastic figure is just a pure Matplotlib um, array. So it's kind of simple. Um, it's actually it's pieces of copy paste from the tutorials from Matplotlib and Cartopy. That's all. Excellent. So in summary, you're using Python and you're exploiting some of the toolboxes that are built into Python, including matplotlib, but also opspy, opspy which yeah. is a uh, toolbox developed for seismologists, by seismologists, and that is an open source program. And it's been used, it's so easy to use, but that it's been used widely within our community by um, hobbyists and people who are I have varying levels of programming abilities, right? You talked about how your program was so simple to execute. They just yeah. had to put in their station name and run it, right? Exactly, yeah. And I would like to thank Emily for putting the links as we talk. It's very cool. Excellent, thank you, Emily. Uh, okay, so the second question we have is, this is a specific one to your study. Now, you mentioned that there were 60 Raspberry Shakes that were used, and obviously there's a lot of Raspberry Shakes in the community. And so um, some of the community members would like to know if their shake was participated in the study. Mm -hmm. Do you have a list of those 60 Raspberry shakes? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's a linked. Uh, I'll give the link and you, we'll put that in the, in the uh, post, uh, post meeting notes. Um, yes, we have in the supplementary material, uh, there is a, uh, a spreadsheet that contains all the station codes um, and the way to get them from the FDSN. Uh, so you can get the code, get that list, and then, and then and try it yourself. And so this list, yes, is, is on the is on the attached to the paper, um, and it's it's available, of course. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, all right. So the next one goes up, brings us up to Alaska. I saw when we started the meeting out today that there were a number of people who had signed in from Alaska. Some of them from Fairbanks. Uh, excellent to have you here, Fairbanks. Uh, I studied in Fairbanks and learned the ropes of seismology up there. So it's very dear to my heart. Uh, and so the question we're getting from Alaska is, uh, were shakes in Alaska used for data to produce the map showing where lockdown effects were seen or, or not? That's a tough question. I don't remember like that. Uh, maybe, not sure. I don't remember really. It's a, it's a, it's a tough one. I don't know. I don't remember. Okay. Okay, good, no problem. I'm sure that um, uh, anyone in Alaska who has a Raspberry Shake can be assured that 
all of their data is, uh, that they've shared in real time with the community is archived on the Raspberry Shake servers and made available to the entire uh, citizen and professional science communities for research purposes. Brandon, we are very lucky that part of the uh, co-authorship, the adv advantage with having 75 co-authors that some are here and Paula just sent the link to the uh, Excel, the spreadsheet file where we, people can find if their Raspberry Shake has been used. All right, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thanks, thanks Paula. Um, okay, so the next question is also about global noise levels. Um, so as a result of the global noise levels being seriously reduced over the past year, what opportunity does this provide seismologists like yourself um, to detect earth noise that was not previously detectable by all of us noisy human beings? So this is work in progress, of course, because yeah, this, this synced um, quieting was, was the first time. So we, we first focused on the, on the sim, uh, symptom. Um, now people are, are really looking to the data and we already see a few, few articles, scientific articles coming out where, uh, for example, in Canada or in France uh, or in, in New Zealand, you have identifications of more small events that would be hidden by seismic noise. Again, if your washing machine is running or if you have a construction site next to a professional seismometer, that's the same effect. The local vibration, local pollution, really the noise in the bad sense of the term, uh, is affecting your readings. And then you cannot detect these small events. If you take a, a normal catalog, like the catalog from the Royal Observatory of Belgium during seismic swarms, and you plot the number of events per class of magnitude per hour, you see that you have only small events at night. There's nothing to do with the sun. It's just because it's too noisy during the day that you don't have the small events, which are very small in amplitude and high in frequency. They are completely vanishing in the seismic. So these, these are the opportunities. Going down, searching for more information in data, listening to the small little hello of the Earth better. And this, this has already been shown, at least in Canada, this is published. Uh, in New Zealand, we show there are some events that are clearer. In Mexico, uh, some events are, are, me are measurable in Mexico City without filtering, that normally they require heavily, heavy filters to, uh, to really get the data out of the, of the, of the noise. Um, so it, these are the opportunities. And then uh, people like me, we use also noise for this coherent waveform, coherent information extraction using cross correlation. So you compare waveforms recorded by two seismometers at different places. And usually we are limited in the bandwidth, in the band frequency band that we can use because high frequency is damped or damaged by local high frequency noise. So if it's very quiet, we might see better waves crossing the uh, or, or seismic stations like this. This is, this is work in progress. And I'm sure in the coming year, we'll, we'll see more and more of these studies. Excellent. So you plan that, you, you estimate that the scientific community will continue to look at the data from Corona, the lockdown period, and learn about um, what it would be like essentially if they were to tell all the humans to take a holiday again, and yep. uh, and and be able to see exactly what the Earth was doing, uninterrupted by cultural noise. Yes, and there is one little thing also is that most of the lockdowns were enforced very sharply, but then the deconfine was was progressive. So you can use that to, to decipher the mix of sources you have recording in your seismic instrument. You can really say, okay, the, only the, the metro and the tram were running, but no cars. Okay, what, what does it look like on my seismometer? And then they will allow cars, and then you see what this mix becomes. And then, so you can study these things together. Excellent. Okay. One of the things I'll add to that is that everyone, and I'm sure everyone has heard about um, especially when the USGS or, or your country's Geophysical Institute reports an earthquake, they assign a magnitude to that earthquake. And so let's say you hear about a magnitude five earthquake. There's an order of magnitude for every magnitude five, there's an order of magnitude more magnitude fours. And, and even, you know, the, it's, um, the, it scales up very quickly as you go down in magnitude. And so the lower magnitude events that we can't hear with the seismometers because uh, all of us are making so much noise with our cars and machinery, those suddenly became available to scientists and they were able to see them. Um, they totally expected them to be there, but it was nice to be able to see those higher levels of seismicity 
during the lockdown period. So the, the next question we have is a longer one. I'll set it up here. Um, the question is, did you find some areas with an increase of noise during the pandemic? Now, um, the, the example that's given is I live in a small community where people commute about 45 to 60 kilometers to work. And now while they were gone, it was very quiet. Uh, now that people are staying home, I've noticed a large increase in the noise of my raspberry shake since more people are staying at home and they're active within my community. So is this something that you saw as well? Yeah, we saw it in, in, in a few cases. The, the, the main issue, which is a good thing, is that the positions of the seismometers are stealth. So um, we didn't really look more into it because we were looking at, at, at things going down. We know, we know in some communities that it indeed went up also by just the fact that people were home with uh, three children uh, screaming in the, in the living room next to the, to the, the raspberry shake. Um, but in the end, I mean, Paula can testify that her, her raspberry shake in London, they, they were with the whole family home, but then it was still was quieter than before lockdown. Um, we also noticed in cases, for example, in Stanford or roads to the hospitals and stuff like that, that you would might have an increase of, of um, sadly, of, of traffic. Um, these these were a bit stronger, but we didn't really look too much into it. It would be really interesting to look at, specifically for cases where, where people really know, know this. And so for that person, feel free to contact me. I can guide you through the code to run it uh, and, and to see and, and to, to, to really add to the blog post uh, to see really this increase. All right, Thomas, thank you for, for being so gracious with your time and answering questions. Uh, I think we have time for two, maybe three more questions. And the next one is specific to 2021. And so the question here is that a lot of places in the world have gotten back to business as normal. At least, you know, people are commuting back and forth to work or going shopping again, and they're not under total lockdown. Other places are still under some form of total lockdown. Mm -hmm. So have you been able to see any interesting patterns in 2021? No, not specifically for countries, I mean, specific countries or specific cities. What has been shown by many people here on Twitter or, or in the community is that it's, even though we have the feeling that it's going back to normal, it's still lower lower than normal. The plot we saw from, from Jay, uh, except from the, the roadworks next to, to the station, uh, showing that it's like 20% 20, 20 lower than before. The campus, university campus are not... At full, at full occupation. The school campus are not at full occupation. I haven't been to work since one year. So I didn't take uh, any transportation, even bicycle to go there, maybe only 10 times. So even though it feels like shops are open and we can commute and, and many more people commute, not everywhere is, is, is back for, to normal. And actually I want to say that maybe it's a good time to ask ourselves what this normal is. And maybe this past normal, we don't want to go back to that past normal with all the traffic jam and everything. Mm -hmm. We want the economy to restart. We want the venues and cultural activities to restart. I don't want traffic jam to restart. Let's think about it. Let's just, just change that. Yeah, well, that, that's okay. That's a perfect segue to this next question because it gets right at that. It says, you know, if you have, if you're noticing and, and during the lockdown that the noise is going down, but you also see this on weekends, you see this on holidays, is most of this cultural noise due to traffic? Is it most of it due to cars or are there other significant factors that are, are in play and need to be considered? It's, it's mostly transportation in general. So train, trams, metros, cars, uh, definitely. Uh, planes passing by above, above your seismometer also generate waves. Um, so transportation is a major culprit. Of course, industry in general also, but depending, of course, in, in, behind me, you have the seismic station of, of Uccle in Brussels. It's There is no industry next to it. It's mostly roads, um, commuting roads. And, and, and then you have the peaks at, at school times. So school times in Belgium, people go with their cars getting their kids out of school. So yes, it's mostly transportation globally. Of course, there's there's other other sources. Just like if you're next to a to a, a stadium, that's not transportation. That's just the stadium and the, the cheering of the fans when there is a goal that just generate your seismic noise. So there, of course, there are other elements, but the major major one is, is mostly traffic road. And and as say, Jay says, he modeled um, some highways 
and generated, uh, so he created very heavy American style vehicles passing on the highway, generating Rayleigh waves or surface waves and, and using uh, amplitude relations and, and attenuations and show that these roads contributed mostly to the, to the noise. Okay, excellent. Thank you for these very clear explanations, Thomas. So we'll go with um, our final question here. And then Mark, if you can get ready, I'll be introducing you in a minute. Um, the final question we have is about posit, uh, policy. And so you're talking about reconsidering, you know, what, what are normal human activity and patterns were pre-pandemic given what we now know. Have you seen any suggestions in your research um, that your research is, in, is, is or will impact policy changes uh, within government? We have heard one story of uh, seismic noise being mentioned as a during uh, a ministry meeting that it was going up again and that people were not respecting rules. That actually was not the case because it was just a quarry which was allowed to work next to the seismic station. So that was not the case. That was in Ireland. Um, I've read, I think, two papers mentioning that uh, these elements, these seismometers are, are dark fibers, like so these, these um, optical fibers used as, as seismometers could be used to really track pedestrians. It's a bit like this scary uh, plot I showed you from this um, paper on homeland security. Um, there are probably ways to do it. I, I honestly have a, a, a more... Um, uh, romantic vision of my work than that. Uh, I hope it will not be uh, used in a bad way, uh, certainly not for restraining liberties and, and freedom of movement of people, uh, as we could expect in different places in the world. But in terms of seeing, for example, if you have a car-free Sunday and monitoring if people respect it, that, that could be definitely something to, to, to think about, yes. Okay. Well, Thomas, Thank you very much. I'll see you in 30 minutes. Right. Thanks. All right. So, Thomas, if we wouldn't mind uh, muting your microphone, and Mark, if you could unmute your microphone, I'll introduce you, and then I'll pass you the floor. Thank you. So, Mark Vanstone uh, represents the other side of this equation. So, we just heard from our professional seismologist. Mark is a citizen seismologist. Um, and Mark requested that I introduce him by uh, bringing your attention to the fact that he's also a geology graduate. He is a, currently a school teacher and a hobbyist, and he's one of the co-authors on the paper that was led by Thomas and published in Science. Now, Mark, uh, I'll add to that and say that Mark is an incredibly enthusiastic hobbyist and citizen seismologist. He's very creative very active on Twitter and has, um, we've, at least at Raspberry Shake, we've seen his interests go from, you know, just, just a, an interest that he's doing and, and getting started with to something he's very passionate about in a, in a short amount of time, just over the past, I think, maybe year and a half. And so, Mark, it is a pleasure to have you in the community. We're very grateful for the time that you're going to spend with us today. And I pass you the floor for your presentation. Thank you. So thank you everyone for this kind invitation. Um, I'm really delighted to be here to speak to you. Um, as Brandon says, I'm taking the, the other side um, of this discussion um, about um, bridging the gap between the hobbyist and the professional communities on, uh, in monitoring the earth. Um, if you want to know where the image is, it's close to my home in Cornwall, where we have a long history of um, mining industry and uh, of involvement with geology and a very interesting geology as well. So over the next 20 minutes, I want to talk about my pathway into citizen science and specifically how I got involved in Thomas's paper. So here is that pathway as a diagram showing the structure of this presentation. So my Raspberry Shake journey started with an educational outreach project. Um, it was here that I was introduced to free and open so source seismology software, and then was shown how to access open seismology data. 
As I developed my expertise, I joined the community on Twitter, which included a group of very generous geoscientists who have included me in their science communication and outreach, as well as incorporating me in this global lockdown study. Following their example, I've tried to also be open with the code I've written and to give back to the community. So that's my pathway into citizen science. My experience of raspberry shakes started in the autumn of 2018. My school was given a raspberry shake 4D by our local geothermal project, who also provided a lecture on geothermal energy and seismology for students, as well as accommodating us um, at their site for various visits um, by, by interested geology students. Um, their their um, project geologist, Lucy Cotton, is shown in the bottom left of this picture. Um, she is a former student and um, she presented to the students and to, um, to us as teachers when we visited them. Professor Ian Stewart is a television geoscientist who also spoke as well. In July 2019, um, the Geothermal Project organised a raspberry shape hub on the site of their deepest onshore borehole in the UK, United Downs. Um, and as well as updates from Lucy and Ian, Paul Denton in the bottom right of the British Geological Survey introduced us to three things. And these three things have been keys for me to unlock the Raspberry Shake data. And they were, first of all, OBSPI, this Python toolbox for seismology that's already been mentioned in Thomas's presentation. Um, secondly, how to download Raspberry Shake and other seismometer data from web services. Now, this included things like the British Geological Survey seismometers and using FTP. So there was a range of different quite technical things that they did. But one of the things they introduced was how to access the locations of the Raspberry Shakes um, so that you can actually find them um, and download their data from these services. And then thirdly, um, websites for finding earthquake events. Um, you may well be familiar with them. Um, we've got the United States Geological Survey, we've got the European um, Seismic Centre, and we've also got the British Geological Survey. And if you don't already know it, the United States Geological Survey website is particularly good. You can browse earthquakes in a map view, look at further details of the quake, query their database of earthquakes by date and geographic coordinates, and easily download earthquake data for investigation in a spreadsheet. Um, some of my students have been subjected to this. Um, they were IT students rather than geology students. I'm not quite sure that they knew what hit them, but the data is there and it actually um, is great as a teacher for graphing and for trying to find out what's going on. Um, Earthquake View on the Raspberry Shake site is also developing into a similar powerful and comprehensive site for viewing recent earthquakes. But these were the keys to unlock everything else that I've done since. OBSPI, having access to um, open data provided mainly by um, the, the organizations who run the seismic networks around the world and from Raspberry Shake, and also these websites showing me the earthquake events that have happened. Now, over the next five months, I developed my proficient, proficiency with OBSPI. I was teaching computer science, um, so actually practicing my Python was really helpful. Um, and I mainly shared information with people I'd met at this hub. My first seismological tweet was in December 2019. The tweet itself included a section plot for a small earthquake in southwest England. I also started sharing my code on GitHub. Over the next few months, my engagement in Twitter gradually grew. You can see it on the bar chart showing the number of tweets in my Twitter history. To me, the seismological community on Twitter felt like being invited into the university professor's coffee lounge or attending a poster presentation at a conference. It's been a, a source of information, education and inspiration. I've really appreciated learning from the tens of professional and citizen scientists who have generally, generously helped me along the way. The pie chart here 
shows the first names of the top 19 people whose Twitter handles appear in my history. And I've checked the attendee attendees while I should have been listening to Thomas and quite a few of you are listening this evening or this morning, wherever you are. This illustrates how open the professional seismological community is. If you're on the chart, thank you for your time and for remaining positive and encouraging. At the top of the list is Steve Hicks of London Imperial University, who has helped me by locating earthquakes, locating quarry blasts, locating microseismic events. He's helped me to understand storm noise and has put me in contact with other experts who have answered my specific questions. Second is Emily Wallin of the United States Geological Survey, who has helped me with my Python, helped me turn counts into real world units on plots, showed me how to access data from USGS seismometers that she's installed in Puerto Rico and helped me to visualize Rayleigh wave dispersion. Thomas is third, but we're gonna to come to him later. By the end of March, I was reporting detected earthquakes, creating section plots, analyzing storm noise, and looking at Rayleigh wave dispersion, as well as trying to reproduce plots made by scientists on Twitter using Cornish seismometer data. Thomas's work came at the right time in my development, and it also coincided with the start of the Easter holiday. I adapted his code for the Raspberry Shake and produced a time series plot, which I tweeted on March the 29th. And although I had been using GitHub for a while, Thomas needed to explain to me what a pull request was. I was on a really steep learning curve, which actually was a very exciting place to be. And I was also there on the list when Thomas made his offer on the 1st of April, 2020, and then explained that it wasn't a joke. I have to say that I felt completely out of my depth. So you've seen this plot, or at least you've seen one like it shared by Thomas. And I'm gonna go through the specific details of what we could see in our school. This particular time series plot extends from the start of December, 2019, into July 2020 for the Truro School shake. The blue lines show peak seismic noise levels in the four to 14 Hertz band, which is just below the lower range of human hearing at 20 Hertz. The orange line shows median daytime noise. Lockdown is shown with the two vertical red bars, one solid, the other dotted. The graph clearly shows daily and weekly cycles, the term time and holidays, but also the lockdown for COVID-19, which began at the end of March. Normally, the only time that the school site shuts completely is over Christmas. Every other evening, weekend or school holiday, the school site is busy. We're also on the edge of a small city of Truro. After the first week, when the teachers taught remotely from school, the Easter period was quieter than our Christmas closure. When the summer term started, key workers' children were hosted on site and our kitchens were taken over by a charity, but there was only a gradual increase in noise. Weekends remained as quiet as Christmas throughout the summer term. As lockdown gradually eased, the noise didn't return to its pre-lockdown levels, and it still hasn't even now. Now, if you feel inclined to try out Thomas's code, the link is at the bottom of this slide, and you are free to download it, adapt it, and use it yourself. He gives instructions for setting it up in the README file on GitHub, and I would strongly recommend you give it a go if you haven't done so already. These graphs are mapped clock plots. The lighter colors represent more seismic noise. The left-hand plot is from December 2018 in the center to July 2019 on the outside. So it represents a normal year. The right-hand plot is from December 2019 in the center to July 2020 on the outside. And it represents our lockdown year. 
each day is a narrow circular band. In a normal year, noise increases on the site from about 7.30, although the cleaners get into school much earlier. Lunch begins at 12.30 p.m. and most people leave the site when clubs finish at 5 p.m. The school finally quietens down around 10 p.m. when the senior boarders return to their rooms. The plot is in UTC. So when daylight saving starts at the end of March, shown by the orange dot on the left hand plot, the lunch noise and borders lights out spring forward by an hour. On the right hand plot, the effect of the lockdown is clear with blue quiet after the orange dot. The overall range of ground displacement is also much lower, yellow being 2.9 on the right diagram and 4.1 on the left. And remember, all of this data comes from just one raspberry shake. But as Thomas has already shown us, this data analysis was repeated for raspberry shakes and broadband seismometers across the world, where the pattern of quietening was repeated over and over. My final pair of lockdown plots are these clock plots. They show seismic noise levels hour by hour for the Truro School seismometer. Distance along the radius represents the amplitude of the seismic noise. There are different lines for each day of the week before and after lockdown. In this case, the left plot shows the Christmas holiday and spring term up to lockdown. The right plot shows the Easter holiday and summer term after lockdown. On typical weekdays, you can see staff and pupils arriving from 7.30, a break at 10.30 and lunch from 12.30. Weekends were still moderately noisy, particularly Saturdays when there were often sports fixtures. Post lockdown daily noise was similar to a weekend, only the noise started and finished earlier. Um, it's really interesting to see here how the, the I just presume the borders get up quite late on a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, and also this is this will probably be an event when a sports fixture is finished and people have come down for refreshments. If you do decide to produce these plots for your shake using Thomas's code, you might want to think twice before publishing them if it's clear where you live and if they show a pattern with you always out on a particular time. This is one reason why Raspberry Shake don't publish the exact location of the shakes. Although I started off the project coding and processing data, my main contribution to the project as it moved on was to give feedback on the output of the software, to proofread and give feedback on the text and diagrams. But it was fascinating to watch such a large team working together on Slack and working together on Google Docs. Even as a newcomer, I'd been into, invited into a significant global study. And the reason I stayed the course was because Thomas made sure I was included and he consistently made me welcome, which is something I really, really appreciate. So what do Shakers have to offer and how can we can continue to be involved? Some shakers live in earthquake prone areas where the first priority is safety. For Shiba Subedi of the Nepali Schools Raspberry Shake project, his priority is to warn people about the danger of earthquakes and help them to prepare. It's an urgent and important task in Nepal for which he is harnessing the shakes. And I have learned a lot by remotely attending two of his workshops. It's also worth remembering that not all shakers are citizen scientists. Many are academics and they already provide a bridge between the communities. My experience has been that it is possible for me to explore data in my limited geographic area, extending across the seismic wave field from waves with a period approaching 50 seconds to waves oscillating at 50 cycles per second. There is a lot to study, even from one raspberry shake, but I can access data from thousands and regularly do. The community of shakers is also international. It's been a huge pleasure to share code with a pupil in Thailand. 
and to attend a virtual seminar after a summer school at Northwestern University, where two students used my resources to teach themselves OBSPI. We are part of a global network of seismometers, and each seismometer is associated with an individual citizen scientist. When we share information and expertise, the whole experience becomes far more fulfilling and exciting. Accessing the whole Raspberry Shake database to produce my earthquake summary sections has been a massive privilege. As a final example, I want to highlight three citizen scientists from a small group of shakers who publish infographics on Twitter to show their data. Steve Caron in California, Giuseppe Petrica in Scotland, and Alex Rutson in England, and I think everyone is on the call. Each has developed their own style, but our charts have developed in tandem. So we've developed them at the same time. And it's fascinating to compare their infographics and process data with mine. And I'm gonna show one quick comparison before I close. In the last few days, both Steve Caron and I have produced similar plots showing the earthquakes we have detected in California and in Cornwall. This is Steve's plot. He sees a lot of small local earthquakes. So I would have expected that part of his plot to be very different to mine. He has also owned a shake for longer than we have. So he has more data um, and he has completed the process of working through all of his database. Now watch as his plot fades out to reveal mine which I've stretched slightly so the scales match. As expected, we detect very few local earthquakes in the UK, but we see hundreds of distant events from the Pacific Island re region near Fiji, Tonga and Vanuatu. This is because those earthquakes are at the perfect distance for the seismic waves to pass through the core and be concentrated here. I've added the globe from Giuseppe's infographic so that you can see a typical pathway taken by the waves. These summary plots represent hundreds of hours of work and thousands of observations, some expect only an enthusiast would manually do, but the results are exceptionally interesting, especially when you have someone else's work for comparison. There's so much to look at. The mine of available data is very deep and it's mostly free to access. There's plenty of scope for interested citizen scientists to explore this world of earthquakes and continuously discover new things. So with my time up, I want to summarize three takeaway messages. And the first is the importance of open science. With free and open source software, freely available data and open journals, a citizen scientist has access to the same tools and data as the professional scientists. We may not have the same expertise, but the main limiting factor is how much time we're willing to put in. Now, if you're a professional scientist or represent a governing body, thank you for making the science accessible and the data available. My second point is the importance of community. In Twitter and in the Raspberry Shake communities, there is information, inspiration and help available. It's great to develop ideas in parallel with other citizen scientists across the world. In time, I also look forward to participating in local communities again, like the Cornish Raspberry Shake Hub. And then my last point is giving back. Steve, Emily, Thomas and the rest have been a great example to me, sharing their code, share, sharing their expertise, being friendly and encouraging. And this is sometimes that something that I want to replicate and hope that you will do as well. Um, this is a list of the various resources which I found helpful and which you may find helpful. I believe it's being shared by, um, by Raspberry Shake and you can also get, I hope, a copy of this PDF um, presentation later. Which brings me to the close.
and you've got your opportunity to ask me some questions. Mark, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, Mark, I, I want you to know that we estimate that you are speaking to an audience of about 200 people. And so many, many of the people in the audience will likely be in a situation that you were in a year ago, just starting out with seismology, uh, just kind of getting their feet wet, seeing if it's something that they, that's interesting to them. And so the first question for you today is what was the greatest lesson that you've learned um, in the past year, year and a half or so of, of doing seismology? The greatest lesson. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I think probably the, the most important experience was listening to the presentations made at Sheba's Nepali Schools Conference and just realizing the massive importance of the work that he's doing there to communicate something which could be life or death to those students that, that they're reaching out to. Um, I study this because I'm a tinkerer, I'm a hobbyist, I'm interested in the world around me. Um, I like programming, I like electronics. I do it because it, it's interesting to me, but actually Sheba's work is, is really important. And that came home very strongly to me when I was um, trying to communicate what I do to them and realizing that actually I had more to learn from them than I could ever communicate. Wonderful, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Mark, before I pass you another question, my team would like me to announce that there is a second poll uh, that's on display now. And so while we're talking back and forth here, they'd like to us to um, encourage everyone to uh, do this poll. It's very short and it has the objective of trying to understand if you've enjoyed the event and how you would change it, if you would come back for another, is this something that we should repeat in the future? And so um, as with the first poll, thank you very much for sharing your opinion and we're very grateful for, for the time. Uh, now, Mark, let's get back to some of the questions that have come in from the audience. Uh, the first one is, it's funny because this is a question I think I would ask a seismology professor, but we're gonna ask you because I'm sure that you have uh, enough experience now to be able to respond. And it is, what techniques are you using to detect earthquakes? And how many seismometers are needed to do that? Okay, interesting. Um, the first and most important thing that I have to do with my data is to, um, to use different filters to be able to filter out the noise, um, which we get a lot of in Cornwall. I've deliberately got a picture with the sea in it behind me. Um, the sea has a big influence. You get a big storm. We don't see really very much at all on our seismometers except for the storm noise. So um, the first thing is getting the filtering right. Um, I would comment that, that I go searching for earthquakes based upon um, the information from the USGS. So I've written a program to download data from them and then I use that to search for earthquakes by their size and by the distance from where I am here. Um, and I tend to identify the, the earthquakes by um, seeing them on more than one station. Um, and I've got the luxury here of um, six kilometers away, a British Geological Survey broadband station, which I regularly access the data from. Uh, I treat it like it's mine, which I know it isn't. I've got my own seismometer in my garage, um, and then I've got the one at school, and then several other local schools and several other local individuals, including a former student, have all got seismometers. So I, I look at six or eight seismometers um, and try to find patterns across those seismometers. I'm not sure it's completely necessary. The other people that I've mentioned earlier tend to be looking at one seismometer, but because I've got an array of seismometers, I use them. Does well, that wonderful. answer your question, Brandon? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things I'll add to that is that if you're, if you're just starting out and you, don't have, you haven't developed a good eye for detecting an earthquake like Mark has now done, um, or you don't have as much time to dedicate to it as Mark does, you can use the ShakeNet mobile app and we will present you with a list of earthquakes 
uh, in your area and abroad, and we will grab a, uh, a part of your data and display it to you at the time period in which we would anticipate that you would see the earthquake. And so you can go training your eye that way and also interact with the data through the mobile platform. I just would comment, Brandon, that I've written a program that does that. So, so um, that's part of how I find my earthquakes is I have a Python program written in OBSPY, which does precisely what you've just described. Wonderful. Yeah. Now, this is the power of OBSPY is that with very little programming experience, um, but certainly a strong interest, somebody can write a routine for the very first time that takes publicly available data and then plots it uh, in a clever way like that. All right, so our next question uh, is, how do I find out what part of the globe the core shadow zone is for my raspberry shape? Um, That's a, okay. also a very technical question, right? Yeah, but it's also really interesting because um, when, we, when I teach A-level geology, which I do, um, and it was nice to see the comment from my geology teacher and now colleague who, who also is on the call, um, we teach that the shadow zone is 104 to 140 degrees. So it's like it's a fixed thing. Uh, and, you know, you, you write that in answers and we tick it and it's the right, right answer. But it then turns out when you, when you start reading the, the slightly more advanced seismology textbooks that I've bought since this became my hobby, um, that actually it depends upon the depth of the earthquake. So the first point to make is that actually the depth of the earthquake matters and um, it's not 104 to 140 degrees. It's actually um, closer than that if it's a deeper earthquake. Um, and then the last thing that, that um, one of the slides I took out, Brandon, in order to keep myself in the time limit, um, we, we see a lot of earthquakes coming from what would be identified as the core shadow zone. Um, when those earthquakes are either large or very deep, so in, in the UK, we see a, a lot of earthquakes from Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, which, um, yeah, they're quite large, but you wouldn't necessarily expect to be seeing them if you're, the, again, taking this classical A-level textbook view of what the core shadow zone is. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's interesting in some of the textbooks that I've got that they really, really don't emphasize the core shadow zone. So it seems to be one of those things that, that we emphasize to 18 year olds and 17 year olds at school, but actually it's a bit more fluid and a bit more um, difficult to pin down than maybe I anticipated. And it's one of the things I found since looking at our data in detail. Yeah, excellent. I've actually, as a seismologist, I've only now, because of working with raspberry shake, become intimately familiar with this concept of a, of a shadow zone, of there being earthquakes that can occur in a part of the planet where the energy doesn't arrive at where I have my raspberry shake installed at home. Um, which is, as a follow-up question, Mark, is one of the things that the audience, um, at least those who don't have a raspberry shake at home, might be surprised to hear is that you're in England you're in the United Kingdom. How is it that you're detecting earthquakes all over the world? How, how am I detecting earthquakes? How am I, how am I finding out about the waves that arrive all over the world? Or how am I detecting earthquakes from all over the world? Or both? Yeah, the, the, the latter. I mean, you're in a, in a fairly aseismic place with a very simple seismograph, yet you're able to detect earthquakes from 10, 12,000 kilometers away. Yeah, and, and some of them are really strong. Um, it's interesting, actually, that um, some of the earthquakes from Vanuatu and Tonga actually trigger um, Thomas's um, proximity alerts on on the on, on his um, his network. Um, maybe you can ask him that question when we come to the the the, the second panel session, because um, he's texted me before, not texted me before, tweeted me before, when I've put up uh, um, um, an image of an earthquake um, from that area, um, he has come back to me and said, yeah, that's, that's, that's um, triggered ours, because they, they are, the energy is transferred so very, very effectively through the earth, and also it's focused by the core, 
producing something which I've been told is called a caustic. Um, and so the energy gets concentrated at our shake and we can see really, really large spikes like the equivalent of a, of a quarry blast six or eight kilometers away. We see um, earthquakes, magnitude five and a half, magnitude six earthquakes in Vanuatu, Fiji and Tonga as clearly as we'd be seeing um, a, a local quarry blast. Um, no. That's not really asking. We, we, we were discussing this yesterday, weren't we, Brandon? So, so um, places like um, Greece, Thomas was telling us, um, actually are sort of blocked. The energy is blocked from the uh, through the Alps, and that, but actually very deep earthquakes, which have occurred in extremely rigid, very incompressible rocks, um, they can travel all the way through the earth and come to us very, very effectively. So there's a huge amount to learn about the locations of earthquakes, the, the, the magnitude of earthquakes, the, the focal mechanism, and exactly why they appear on our shakes, which they do in abundance. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll share a quick story along those lines. And then uh, I think I'll open the session up to Thomas as well. So Thomas, you can turn your microphone on and we'll move into the final 30 minute block that we have to answer questions from other people in the community. But the story I wanna share with uh, is that when we first launched Raspberry Shake, uh, we had a large number of people from the UK who supported us in our Kickstarter campaign. And it was kind of surprising and unnerving at the same time because we had initially envisioned Raspberry Shake being a seismometer that would be focused on hyper local events. And so we had to do a little bit of re-engineering to ensure that uh, the audience over there in the UK would be able to see teleseismic events reasonably well. And so um, because it seems like there's a large number of early adopters in your part of the world, uh, they had an influence over the design of the, the final uh, seismometer. So um, let's see here. Uh, the next question, and, and Thomas, if you have any comments, you can, you can jump in on this as well. Uh, this next question is from Shiva, and you mentioned that he was doing this project in Nepal. I'll share with everyone that he's recently finished his master's degree, and he's moved on to doing a PhD, and he's actively involved in expanding the seismic network that he's built up in Nepal. Um, he asks, he says, a very nice presentation. Um, how do you verify a detection of an earthquake? And is it done manually or automatic? And thank you for including me in the Nepal School Seismology Project in your presentation. If I just, I think he's just got his you, PhD actually, you, Brandon, hasn't he? What's that? I think he's just got his PhD. So he's just finished his PhD. So we, we made a little bit oh, of so a he's fuss staying of him. On for a postdoc. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And just in terms of what we do, in what I do, it's entirely manual, but then that's that's an easy answer. Mm -hmm. In our case, it's the uh, global networks shared and uh, available for anyone, plus our local network uh, and SaySCOM for the de detection. So it's uh, triggering for any earthquake in the world. And uh, most of the cases we wanted to have the whole of the world to detect magnitudes five or six plus. Uh, but then it's also needed because if you have only a local network, and as Mark said, um, you have a Fiji event coming to Belgium, it triggers all the station at the same time. And it looks like a new subduction zone is building up under Belgium uh, because you're, you have the same time for all stations. So it means that the solution is that the earthquake is deep beneath your feet. So you need also to have further away stations. That's how we do. Excellent. Well, here's, here's a question for you both. I'd like, I definitely like you both to answer this. Is what is the most unusual thing that you've recorded on your raspberry shape? Unusual or interesting? We've talked about earthquakes, but I know Thomas, for instance, that you're using uh, raspberry shapes for Stunning very unusual lights. purposes, aren't you? <laughs> Yeah, trying to try, I mean, hit, hitting stalagmites and looking at the uh, the uh, resonance modes of the stalagmites is, is really interesting. And being able to see that although it looks circular, like really cylindrical, but actually if you hit it on different sides, you don't have the same resonance frequency and you can measure that with the raspberry shake. And so you can identify that the shape dictates the way that the pendulum, I mean, inverted pendulum oscillates. That's quite interesting. And Mark, how about you? 
um, we've detected all sorts of funnies, which which we've shared on Twitter. Um, so fireworks, I, I did try to triangulate or slightly more than triangulate and find the, the height of the fireworks that were fired on, on New Year's um, morning. But unfortunately, we needed one more shake. So if there had been fireworks this last New Year, I was ready to go there with a microphone to give me one more data point to be able to um, work out the height of the fireworks. I think um, the, we, we've had um, well, you've mentioned washing machines. Um, that surprised me when we first put our seismometer in at home. Helicopters, we've got a, a we've got a, um, a air station nearby and looking at the doctor shift on the helicopters is interesting. Um, thunderstorms, um, I think I saw an echo of a, thun of a thunder clap, which echoed off one of the, the valleys and came back to me. I suppose that's the most unusual thing. Sorry, that was four, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, that was four, much appreciated. Um, I, I'll share mine as well. I was on a trip to uh, Potsdam in Germany, and we had deployed a few raspberry shakes at the homes and offices of my colleagues there. And while we were out enjoying ourselves for the weekend, I heard a, an, an enormous explosion. And they said, well, that's kind of normal around here. Those are unexploded ordinances. Um, and when they're doing the construction of a new building, they will uh, go ahead and they'll notify the community that they found one of the ordinances from the World War, and they will either disarm it, and if they can't, they will schedule a detonation. And so we rushed back home and got to look at the detonation, which didn't hurt anyone, uh, on the little Raspberry Shake network that they had established there in, in Potsdam, Germany. Uh, let's see, the, the next group of questions is obviously for, for both of you. So jump in. Um, I'll pass it to each question. I'll pass to either to you, Mark, or to you, Thomas. And then if you want to add something, um, feel free to do so. So this one is about internet connectivity. So the question is that if you have a Raspberry Shake installed in a bunker, or let's say, and like in your case, Thomas, in a cave where you're studying stalagmites, um, how how do you manage the internet connect connectivity? So I'll let Thomas, I'll pass that one to you to talk about a little bit. Uh, so that, that's what we're planning now, because that experiment I showed you was just a few hours work. So that was just on, uh, well, we're lucky because it's a touristic cave. So we do have a power supply and they even have Wi-Fi now and no underground. So that's, that's a, that's a 20, 21st century cave. Uh, but there are other parts of the cave where we don't have that connectivity and we plan to use like power lines or just store locally uh, and I hope that you guys did a good job for the real-time clock when it's completely offline um, but I think in in any case what we did before with other equipment was to start the equipment outside with the GPS on and then leave them on move them inside the cave and at the end do the same up the, in the opposite direction and resync the GPS and then we had the full drift and that was correctable uh, in, in uh, digital uh, signal processing. Um, for, for case for bunkers, if they're not too deep and you have like a, a power uh, grid uh, within the bunker, you can also use what they call the um, uh, line carrying uh, Ethernet connection. So you use the power lines to transmit your uh, Ethernet or your network, and uh, you have different brands doing that. Uh, Devolo is one of the most famous ones, um, and that's quite helpful also to to, for example, to put the shake uh, in your uh, in your shack at the, at the at the end of the of the garden or in in a vault in the garden and have a, an internet connection that's not depending on the Wi-Fi. Excellent. Thank you, Thomas. Mark, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Not really. We use a power line connection to our garage, so we do exactly what Thomas has just said here in my house. And at school, we're powering our shake by um, power over Ethernet. So it's all very standard stuff, but can be bought off the shelf. But good fun. Excellent. All right. I'll add that uh, Raspberry Shake, because it has an Ethernet port, it can communicate through any type of modem, be it a, a GPRS modem, a cell phone modem, a satellite modem, a normal Wi-Fi or Ethernet connection. Uh, everything's compatible. Um, so long as the modem is external to the shake, it's transparent to the shake itself. Uh, I think that, I don't know if the audience can see me while you guys are talking. I believe they can, but uh, from time to time, I, I have smiles that are creeping across my face. And, uh, and that's because as you guys are talking, I'm seeing the comments 
as well that are coming up from people in the community and recognizing a lot of the names um, from the people who are regulars on the tech support forum or regulars in uh, uh, on our, our social media or even people that I met in person. And, uh, and that's, that's, a really, that's a really fun experience. Um, so let's say that this next question we have here is about earthquake protection. And so the user says, and this one's for you, Mark, um, you talked about this a little bit already. Is it normal that the shake can detect earthquakes that are more than 10 kilometers away? And the comment following that is that it's amazing that their shake was, it, where it was able to detect earthquakes in Japan last month. Yeah, if, if um, as you've already pointed out, if the Raspberry Shake couldn't detect earthquakes that are um, further than 10 kilometers away, then there wouldn't be any point in me having one in, in the UK because we just, I, we've, I've had one earthquake um, within 10 kilometers of, of, of our shake and it was tiny. It was a minus 0.1 magnitude earthquake. So it was minuscule. Um, mm -hmm. Everything else we detect is at great distances. And um, I, it, it, it is amazing to be detecting these things from the other side of the world. And over the last year, I've learned a whole load of names of Pacific islands that I didn't know exist, existed before, um, and also become a bit of an expert of the, on the Russian islands just north of Japan and the Aleutian Islands, so over towards, um, over towards Alaska, because those are where we're getting the majority of our earthquakes from. So it's a really good geography, les ge geography lesson. Um, and also it's interesting, I, I, I bought a book by, um, uh, oh, I bought an old book anyway on um, on seismology, and it's fascinating. In the pre-plate tectonics days, how much they were confused by the Pacific Ring of Fire. But then now, you just look at how important it is as a source of, of seismic energy. So yeah, Japan not unusual at all. Yeah, I can share that my experience here in Panama is that I regularly see um, Japanese earthquakes. Uh, I'm currently in my home office, and right beneath the desk here is my personal Raspberry Shake, and uh, it's not uncommon, especially for large magnitude events, magnitude 6.5 and above, to see those earthquakes coming from Japan. And so my general reaction is to look and see, you know, how much damage there is, or will there will there be damage from the earthquake? Um, and when we discover that there's not, to really get excited about and celebrate the opportunity to detect that energy coming from so far away and then to go on Twitter and to participate in the, in the conversation that inevitably ensues when people are sharing, you know, this is the infographics of the waveform as it came in and, and was detected on the shape. Um, and there's a, another experience that I had, which was in uh, Malta. I went to Malta very early in the Raspberry Shake project with the hopes of just promoting Raspberry Shake to the scientific community. It was a conference of the European Seismological Commission. And we had a booth. And at that time, we had a, you know the TV in the background. The network was maybe 600 or 700 shakes strong, um, many of them in Europe. And in the booth at that time, there were a few, there was a mix of seismologists, professional seismologists. So you had people who were um, emeritus, you know, they've gone through their whole career in seismology and they were still involved at some level because it's what they're passionate about. There were younger scientists like myself. There were even undergraduate scientists that were there. And what they had in common is that a lot of them uh, had raspberry shakes. And so there was a big earthquake that happened in Southeast Asia. And we were able to see the earthquake move across Europe in real time on the station view display. And what ensued was totally unexpected. Everyone, whether they were emeritus or, or not, they were jumping up and down in excitement about seeing this earthquake. And there was one gentleman in particular who was recently retired, and he was screaming that he was really excited to see that this earthquake was being recorded on his seismometer at home. He was pointing to the map and expressing uh, his excitement over this. And in that moment for me, I realized that not only can you detect these earthquakes that are really far away, and not only would you be excited about this if you were a hobbyist, 
But Raspberry Shake, because it's installed at home, makes it personal again. And so you take somebody who's gone through the entire career in seismology and you give them a Raspberry Shake and then, and then suddenly they rediscover, you know, the joy of doing seismology, which is a joy that you won't, Mark, you've only recently begun to, to know yourself. So, um, all right, let's go to the next question here. Uh, I wanna move my geophone sensor outside. Okay, so I wanna take it outside the house and I wanna put it underground because I guess the, the objective here is to get a, the lower the, the noise and kind of filter out all that cultural noise that we talked about today. Um, so using a copper cable, how long will the cable be to carry the signal without sacrificing data quality? Okay, I'll take this question because I get this a lot. <laughs> And one of the things that, you know, one of the things that you do when you're designing an instrument that's gonna be low cost and you're trying to make it accessible to as many people as possible, um, especially when you're going from a, a market where the cheapest sensor was thousands of dollars to something that's just hundreds of dollars, uh, you, have to, you have to make certain design uh, requirements that ensure that the price is, is gonna be accessible. Uh, or as accessible as possible. And so one of the things that we did with Raspberry Shake is uh, we made it so that the electronics are, um, are limited, right? And so with the Raspberry Shake, you can't take a copper cable longer than about, let's say 20 centimeters and attach the geophone without it acting like an antenna and you're getting a lot of unwanted noise. Right now, we could design the Raspberry Shake to handle that situation, but because it's so uncommon and because it would add so much to the cost, we've decided not to. So, what we would recommend in that case is if you go onto our blogs, you'll see a number of examples of installations where people have installed the Raspberry Shake underground. And then, what they do to get the distance that you want is they run the Ethernet and the power cables out back towards the house. And so they leave the sensor and the board and the computer and everything in the same enclosure, they waterproof it and they bring the cables uh, uh, for communication to home. And so that I think is the, is the best way to handle that application. Uh, Mark or Thomas, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Just the, uh, the length, um, the ethernet solution you propose would be less than hundred meters would be, would be good. Yeah, Usually. certainly. So cat, cat, yeah, category, category six, cat, cat, cat five or cat six uh, is, is okay for 100 meters. So that would be okay if the cable is also properly shielded and buried. But Yeah, definitely. And avoid definitely. grounding loops. Yes. Okay, another, another common problem. <laughs> Electronic issues. Yeah, classic. <laughs> Don't discourage everyone. They got to try it for themselves. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Next question. Um, in the future, an original Raspberry client, uh, will original Raspberry State client for Windows or Mac be released? Um, so right now, uh, every Raspberry Shake, it's software, let's say, um, will work on uh, Linux and it's, it's currently running on Raspberry Pi. Now, a client for Windows or Mac is, we're not thinking of developing that because the Raspberry Pi computer completely satisfies uh, the need currently to get data up into the cloud. And then once the data is up and in the cloud, whether you're using Mac or Windows or any flavor of Linux, uh, you can use any of our web-based applications, which we're actively developing. Uh, so you won't need any software installed locally on your local operating system. Um, I'll let uh, my team message me if there's any additional technical questions around that. And, uh, and then we'll move on to this next question here, which I think will be uh, a question that one of you guys can take. So I want to know uh, what, the scientific, what scientific experience does anyone have with a raspberry shake and boom, uh, specifically with air pressure? Now, Mark or Thomas, do you guys have a raspberry shake or boom at home? I have a shake, but not a boom. Nope. You don't have the infrasound component? Nope. Okay, all right. 
So in the history of Raspberry Shake, we developed the seismometer, and then we developed an infrasound sensor that you can um, get alongside the seismometer so that you would be able to measure kind of what's happening in the atmosphere, as well as what's happening beneath your feet in the ground. Um, so the question is about how valuable the data is to science, because I have one and I see only noise. Okay, so um, my answer to that noise. is, yeah, right? if you were to ask me the same question about the seismometers five years ago, especially before any of the peer-reviewed journals started publishing um, articles written by scientists on the use of raspberry shake, I would have I would have done this, and I'm still going to do this for the raspberry booms because the answer is that we don't know until somebody who uh, wants to has an original uh, question and wants to test in a hypothesis within the scientific community. Po post that hypothesis and then realizes that there's a data set available from the citizen science com science community that'll help them answer that question. That until that happens, we won't know the utility. Right, and so we have we're archiving and making all the data publicly available in the hopes that when there's an interesting question that needs to be answered, the data is available for the scientists that are asking the question. Uh, Mark or Thomas, do you want to add anything to that? Oh, it's just a matter of curiosity of someone looking at it. I mean, there's meteor exploding in some places. There's there's uh, explosions like you mentioned in Potsdam. There's often fireworks and stuff like that and yeah look at what what mark has shown from the examples from the community of looking not only at the time domain but also at the spectrogram so the spectral content versus time and look at your waveforms for during a fireworks i'm pretty sure you will find the the boom and then the long tails and everything you you need to find on on the raspberry boom i'm, I'm very happy to put the raspberry boom at home i did it probably part of my next order okay all right, wonderful. Um, let's see here. Uh, there's actually a reply from somebody in the community as well. Uh, they posted the comment that for the infrasound part that we call the boom, um, it confirms quarry blasts. You can see aircraft. Um, you can see the Doppler effect. You can see turbines, micro barums. There's lots of things that you can detect. And so if you can detect them as a citizen scientist and they're being registered and timestamped in such a way that they're useful to the scientific community, I think it's only a matter of time before somebody asks an interesting question and they're able to exploit that data and use that data to answer the question. So we have, we have a lot more questions here. We have about, let's say, um, seven or eight minutes. And uh, I think maybe we can do three or four more questions before we, we draw this to a close. What do you think, guys? Silence is a yes? Sounds it good. was a yes. Yeah, it's good. Ah, okay. Um, all right, so the next question is, um, this might be, I'm gonna pass this one to you, Mark. This is about the USGS data feed in which you talked about a little bit there. And it says that the USGS data feed can classify various things like sonic booms, uh, explosions from mines, and obviously earthquakes. Do you think that the Raspberry Shake program will classify such shaking in the future? Do you think that's kind of within the scope of what we'd be able to do as a community? I can't, but um, I know because of the geothermal project, which is just a mile from me, um, I know that their seismometer network already classifies those types of events. So when I get all excited about um, a quarry and ask them what's happened, um, they haven't even necessarily paid any attention to it at all because it isn't a micro seismic event associated with their pumping tests. They can already tell. So I'm, I'm guessing that the likes of, of Thomas or Stephen or somebody could tell us already how to do that. Um, it's not something I know about yet. It's perhaps the next thing for me to read, but our local geothermal project are already doing that. I don't see why you shouldn't. No, it's true. I mean, I mean quarry blasts, that's the easiest ones because they, they, they look like quarry blasts, except if you have a very, very strong local source at less than one kilometer depth that just generates seismic waves that look like quarry blasts. But most of the time, if you have at least one or more sensors, you, you can classify them. Um, Geothermal events, if they're small, they look like small events, so that, that's quite easy to identify. Um, there was also earlier a question about detecting nuclear tests. 
I'm not sure uh, there was uh, in the in the early days of Raspberry Shake uh, was six years ago. Um, there was no. Oh, yeah, there was a test in 2016 in North Korea. Maybe it would be worth looking at what what they, you recorded at that time. I'm pretty sure you have it very nicely uh, because it, it triggered all over the world. Uh, and certainly for the surface waves that passed, I'm quite sure you get it. Yeah, certainly that that, that blast was detected very well across the entire network. So, okay, there's uh, this next question is it says that inside the mobile app, uh, the mobile app is showing the earth, it's showing the event, it's showing the waveform from your Raspberry Shake, and then it shows the arrival time of two different waves, the P wave and the S wave, you know, the two primary and secondary waves that characterize the arrival of an earthquake. How is that being done? And is it being done automatically? Uh, the answer to that is yes, it's being done automatically. What we do in the background is we ingest all the data, and we push it into an automated processing system that's called SizeComp. It's developed by our partners in Germany. And uh, that software is not only locating the earthquake, but it's also estimating the arrival times of different phases for every single Raspberry Shake in the network. And then we push that information to the mobile app. That sometimes it's not always accurate. It, a lot of times it is. It's something that we're fine tuning. The next question is, what do you see is, ooh, this is an interesting one. Uh, what do you see as the next professional citizen science project where we as a community can make a contribution? So Mark, I'm gonna pass that one to you. Oh, I wish I knew. I, I, my, my... My conclusion today was that we as citizen scientists can work together on things that interest us. One of the things that really struck, strikes me about um, professional geologists and seismologists is that they've got to make grant applications, they've got to have funding bodies, they've got to justify their existence, they've got to pay loads of money to journals to, to have their work published. It, it's actually quite an arduous thing for them to do research, whereas we can do it for fun. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I can't, I, 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 I'm going to be working together with people because I'm interested in science. Um, if someone extremely generous and very kind like Thomas wants to involve me in, in the work they're doing, then so be it. But having looked from the inside, I don't envy them having to produce papers. Um, it was a huge amount of work, the, 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 all of the media work that they did, the effort that they went to. Okay, it was worth it. It was great, well, especially sitting and watching people like Thomas doing most of the work and, and Steve and Paula and such like. But it's an enormous amount of work. It's incredible. Um, so I'm, I'm happy doing my, my personal free um, research work with the likes of Steve and Emily and Tom helping me, if that's all right. Thomas, would you like to add anything? <laughs> that Mark is too humble. Um, yeah, the, uh, no, I mean, indeed, um, having having to write paper is different than having the passion to write the one we did together is absolutely different. Uh, the uh, having to is is not a good thing in the in the science world. Um, but uh, being passionate about the subject, finding new results and, and sharing it, being being a paper, being a piece of code or data or just a teaching a classroom, is is more than enough, uh, and and it's more rewarding than the, uh, an auto paper. Um, um, I think the next big projects will involve more and more cases like what we did. And it was it was noticed by the the, uh, the reviewers, was noted by the editors. And there's no no doubt why we were successful at publishing at, in science. I mean, the seismic noise going down when there is a part when there is a, a snow event or a, a, a car free Sunday is nothing new. What was new is the way we handled it, the way we created, benefited from the community and did it as, as a whole. And this, I think, is the, the, the future of, of many or many of these elements. You have new projects starting by recording safe, audible noise in cities. Um, there is so there is this quiet project. There are cases where people are uh, using apps to identify birds and classifying them. And this is relying on not only what Mark says as a goodwill or free time, but on passion. People have a passion. As you said, your emeritus professor he was very happy to have a seismometer at home. And he's probably one of the most eager to share his, his, 
his P pix is is PKP pix is any face pix because he is so happy that he can contribute to it. And okay, my my way is to 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 involve all that into 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 uh, my research. And I'm I'm sure this is what people will do more and more in the future. You've seen. Uh, people uh, providing their um, their cell phone accelerometers as detectors to the to the um, the project by uh, Ching Kai Kong in, in Berkeley. Uh, you have many 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 cases like that. You you had um, the uh, detectors of, of infrasound in built in Apple uh, a few a few years back by um, Milton uh, Garces. Um, you have many many cases where people will just give their time and even if not their time like like the city project city at home i mean computing for whatever or folding folding proteins to find medicines or finding vaccines i mean the power in the people's in people's brain not only their computers is, is enormous and we don't we i mean that's what i, I meant by don't do it the old-fashioned way just Think, think out of the box and people have a lot to give if you let leave them a chance, children included. Yeah. Thomas, thank you very much for those, those insights. Uh, certainly within the realm at, at this time and age, within the realm of citizen science, there are ample opportunities to get involved and to obviously to have an impact. And the paper that both of you guys came together with, with so many other co-authors to write and publish in science, is an excellent example of that. And so um, we're at 3 p.m., at least at my time here in Panama, which means that I have to bring the event to a close. Uh, I would like to um, say some thank yous first uh, to all of the shakers that are in the audience and all the guests. Thank you very much for sharing this space with us today. Uh, to Thomas and Mark, thank you for Thanks. all of the time and energy you put into making this a success. Uh, to everyone that's behind the curtain and out of the spotlight at Raspberry Shake, that's working hard in the background to make Raspberry Shake successful. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, to every one of you for everything you do. Um, and then I'll, I'll close by saying kind of at the end of this, we really, we really want to understand from the audience perspective, what it was you enjoyed and how you would do things differently. And so at the end of this uh, Zoom call, we'll be sending out a survey. We encourage you to take a few minutes to, to answer it, to let us know your thoughts, to let us know how we can do better. Um, we listen to you all the time and we're eager to hear your opinion. Um, and then the exclusive offer. Uh, we are offering to everyone who's participated today a, um, a discount code and Giuseppe will be putting this inside of the comment section and then we'll send it out again in an email. The discount code is Shake Meetup, and it gets you 25% off a Raspberry Shake for home and classroom use. The offer is gonna be valid for two weeks. We encourage you to share it with your friends, family, and colleagues. And we hope that it will help us to expand our community further and, and gather additional data that'll be useful to hobbyists and to the scientific community. Um, so with that, I have one more comment and that is that if your question wasn't answered, please message us at community.raspberryshake.org. We have a very active technical support forum. We're eager to hear from you and to reply to your questions. Uh, and that wraps today's event up. So uh, depending on where you are in the world, good day, good afternoon, good evening, and may the force be with you.